In this video, I wanted to take a minute to talk about a topic that's in the news all the time. The topic is deep learning. So I want to walk through you know, in a very detailed fashion what deep learning actually is. And in doing so, I also want to hopefully dispel some myths about the, the power of machine learning and explain how some of the concepts like how bias gets embedded into deep learning models, how that can come about. Okay, so let's start with what is deep learning in a big picture way. So deep learning is a subfield of AI. So we have AI, we have machine learning, and inside of the machine learning field, we have deep learning. So this is a Venn diagram and, and deep learning is you know, fully included in the realm of AI. Whereas some kinds of more classical AI systems would have been algorithms that humans built directly to kind of do some tasks. So we have like an AI engineer here, they're typing code on their machines, they build some algorithm, and that algorithm then takes in some information from the world and spits out, you know, a prediction, something relevant to that particular data. So this might be, the data input might be, you know, I'm at my house and I want to go to the grocery store, what route should I take? And Google Maps is an AI system of the classical variety. It doesn't use, as far as I know, too much machine learning. It's more built on you know, graph theory and pathfinding, but it's still considered to be an AI system. Whereas machine learning and deep learning, both of these fields involve a different process. And so the, the primary difference is for ML engineers, if I'm an ML engineer, I'm typing on my computer, I still build an algorithm, but instead of building an algorithm that solves my problem directly, I build an algorithm that takes in many, many training samples related to the problem I want to solve. The algorithm accepts those data points produces what's called a model. And that model then is the thing that I use to actually answer my question. So if we're sticking with the, how do I go from point A to point B example, this would be a series of A to B problems where we already know what the right answer is, what we want our machine learning model to learn. And then later I'll send my model the same question, hey, how do I go from my house to the grocery store and the model produces our answer. Okay, So this extra step where I produce an algorithm that is capable of learning from data how to actually answer the question rather than thinking about what to do specifically. And you know, I think it's really worth asking the question and answering the question, why is this done? So it's an extra step. It's more complex. It requires us to collect data, sometimes, you know, millions, millions of data points. It requires this process here, which is the training process where I send my data to my algorithm. This makes the computational costs quite large compared to standard AI development. Um, but there are some benefits and I want to explain what those benefits are. So before, before I do that, I want to say the big difference between machine learning and deep learning is deep learning is a specific kind of algorithm and it produces a specific kind of model and these are called neural networks, which you may or may not have heard of. So there are many different kinds of neural networks. We're going to talk about the simplest kind of neural network, which is also sometimes called a multi-layer perceptron in this video. And we're not going to talk about any other kinds of machine learning, just deep learning. Okay. So why go through this learning process? Why take this extra step right here? So the main reason it's just a big little barrier. The main reason is it's hard for humans to think about some processes or some patterns or 
or it's hard to understand what the right answer, what the algorithm would look like. So to give you an example, deep learning has become very popular in both the computer vision field, you know, taking image data or video data and doing something with it and answering questions, you know, like where are the humans in this data? Is this a picture of a cat or a frog? And it's also very popular in natural language processing. So take a sentence in a human language and try to derive its meaning in some way. You know, identify the nouns, identify the um, sentiment. Is this a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment? Translate this from one language to another language. These are examples where deep learning is powerful. And so to motivate why this is helpful, let's say I gave you a picture and I said, I want you to write an algorithm by hand that tells me whether or not this is a picture of a cat. Okay. Is this a cat? And you might start by thinking like, okay, well, I've got to, okay, I've got to find out where the edges in this photo are. So imagine this is a photo, not just some hand drawing, then it's going to have rich detail and lots of colors. And we're going to want to be able to isolate the cat part of the photo, the part that we think maybe is a cat from the other parts of the photo. So maybe we start doing some edge detection. And there are some classical algorithms for edge detection. They could say, okay, you know, there's some lines here, there's some lines here, there's some lines here. And then we could start saying, okay, well, now that we've got those edges, maybe we should try and find out where are their like triangular features in this image because we're looking for cat ears, okay? So let's try and find some cat ears. Maybe we should also look for colors that are relevant to cats, but cats come in lots of colors, but not every color, you know. If there's a lot of bright pink inside of the catish portion, then we're going to say, well, that's not a cat. And then you have to start thinking about, okay, what about cats in various different poses? You know, are they facing the camera? Or are they sideways from the camera? Are they doing some like cat bending move where, you know, they're cleaning themselves and their leg is straight up in the air? So it starts to be clear that this is a really hard problem to solve directly. It's not clear what things about a photo make it a cat. So with machine learning, with deep learning specifically, instead of having an engineer type on this problem and you know try and write an algorithm that's like, you know, what's a cat? And encode that exhaustively in you know custom written software. Instead, a software engineer just gets to make a template for a neural network a neural network, which we'll talk about what this looks like in just a second, but I just build a template for a neural network and there's lots of different architectures that are already, you know, at this point, well explained and we know that they work in certain contexts and that they can do certain things. But I just take a neural network architecture and then my goal is no longer to say like, define what's a cat. It is now to collect a data set, collect a data set with many pictures of many cats and as long as this data set is representative of what a cat is in a photo, then we can feed that into my neural network and have my neural network learn what a cat is. So through this training process, we'll get out a model and this model will be hopefully, if it worked, a good answer to the question, what is a cat, okay? So sometimes we call this process feature extraction, where we're trying to take this image and determine, you know, what are the relevant features that make a picture a cat or not a cat, or, you know, that make this picture in facial recognition terms, make this person this individual, or, you know, whatever else it is, okay? So this is the idea, and this is why machine learning has become so popular, is because it allows us to essentially automate this feature extraction process. And in a field like computer vision or natural language, it's actually really, really hard to mathematically or algorithmically explicitly define all the possible features that make something a cat. And so automating that process away through the training process is a way that we can trade 
brain power, we don't have to be universe brains and figure out all the possible things that make something a cat. We trade that brain power for CPU power. And, you know, we say like, well, okay, the GPU goes burr. And therefore, once we do this training process for many hours, our algorithm will have learned something about what a cat is. Okay, so the next question is, how then? How does this training process work? And what does it look like to train a neural network? And what is the model itself? Okay, so this is the part of the lesson where I disappoint everybody because we tend to think of AI and neural networks, well, neural network, wow, it sounds like a brain and it's inspired by brains, but it's, it's actually, even though it's very, very complex, it's sadly so much simpler than a brain. And this is where a lot of misunderstandings about the power of AI and how quickly it's coming for, you know, all these zillions of jobs and how it's going to replace everything. This is where this kind of breaks down. So here's the disappointing truth. The neural network, an artificial neural network, always represents a math function. It's just a math function. It's a very complex math function. But the fundamental hypothesis of neural networks is I've got some data, in our case, continuing, pictures of cats, maybe. The hypothesis is there is some math function that reasonably approximates the answer to the question, is this a cat? So there is some function that maps this image data into a yes, no decision, a one or zero problem. So they're just math functions. They're really, really fancy math functions. And we use a, a graphical mental model to understand these math functions because math functions um, that represent neural networks can get so complex that it's just not reasonable to try and write them down in standard mathematical notation. OK, so we use what are called computational graphs. And I'm going to write a computational graph for a simple function just to illustrate the point. So imagine we have f of x is equal to 2x plus, I don't know, 7. Okay. This is a really, really simple math function. And we can actually, let's do a more complex math function. So let's say we have a function that takes in three inputs, f of x, y, z. It's a bad z. And this function is x plus y times z. Okay. In computational graph format, this function would look like this. We have, oopsies, we have three input nodes one for x, one for y, one for z, because these are the inputs to our function. The x and the y go together because they get added first, so they go to an addition node. And then the result of that addition node goes to another node, a multiplication node, with z. And then this is the output of our function. Okay, so if we wanted to execute an individual sample of this, say f of 1, 2, 3, then we would say, okay, well, x is 1, y is 2, z is 3. The result of adding 1 plus 2 is 3. So this edge would get a 3 output value. And then 3 times 3 is 9. So we have a 9 output value here. Okay? So this is a very simple example of a computational graph. And you know, it's probably not necessary in this case, because it's a simple function, and it was easy to write down. But in neural networks, the functions get very, very complex. Okay. So let's take this one step further and let's examine what a neural network looks like. We're going to do a three-layer neural network with one hidden layer. Okay. So we've got an input layer. And we'll just stick with three values for the input, even though typically the input sizes in a neural network are, are going to be thousands to ten thousands 
of values. This is not uncommon. You can have smaller input input layers, but this is just related to the size of the input. So if you've got you know a 200 by 200 image that you want to pump through a neural network, the input size is going to be that 200 by 200 image, which you know is quite large. Okay, it's lots of nodes. So in our three three input nodes, and then let's say we have an internal single internal layer or hidden layer, that's what they're called, with just two nodes in it. And then we want this problem, we want to map these three values to a binary yes or no decision. So our output layer is also going to be two nodes in that case, one for each possible outcome. The way neural networks work is every node in every layer has a connection to every node in the following layer. So each of these two input nodes is going to have lines, edges, to each of those two hidden layer nodes. And each of our two hidden layer nodes is going to sim similarly have an output to each of the output layer nodes. Okay, so this is the computational graph for our very simple neural network. And in deep learning models in the real world, you'll have hundreds of layers. Each of those layers will be thousands, hundreds to thousands of nodes in each layer. And so they're much more complex than this simple graph, but while we're just trying to learn how they work and what they are, we'll stick with something simple, okay? So this is kind of the structure of a simple neural network. And I want to look carefully at what a single node looks like. So every node in a neural network is, is typically doing some something very similar to all the other nodes in a neural network. But overall, through all this massive complexity, they add up to something that becomes kind of unique and different. So let's scroll down here and just look at one node. Remember, each of these nodes has some number of inputs. So in the example above, this node has three inputs from the previous layer. Okay. And each of those inputs has something called a weight associated with it. So we'll call this weight zero, weight one, and weight two. And these weights, as well as something that's internal to the node called the bias, these two values, the weights and the biases, are the things that change during the training process. Okay, so we'll talk about the training process in a second, but these, these values are just modified up or down a little bit each time we train a sample. So we send a sample through or a batch of samples through, we look at the answers, and then we adjust the network. You know, if you did really bad, you got 100 cats and you only said one image was a cat, then we adjust these weights by a lot and adjust the biases by a lot. And if we were right 99 out of 100 times, then we're just going to adjust them a little, you know, very tiny amounts because we're mostly doing good. Okay. So each of these input values, the input from the previous node, is multiplied by the corresponding weight on that edge. And then the result of those multiplications is added together. So we do a sum operation. And in addition to the weighted input values for that node, the bias is also added to the sum. Okay, after that, the sum is sent to something called an activation function. And this word activation comes from um, actual brains. These were inspired by human neurons. And so activation levels have meaning in um, neurobiology contexts. And so that's where this word comes from, activation. But this activation function could be any number of functions. There are a few of them. And maybe after this video, you can look up exactly what they do. But some common ones are the sigmoid, although this has fallen out of favor. This was kind of the original. Something called ReLU, short for rectified linear unit, is a popular activation function. And these are also just math functions, just like the sum operation. These are functions that take in this single value and map it to a single output value. So a sigmoid function looks kind of like this. It doesn't have a little curve there, okay? So a sigmoid function looks like that. A rectified linear unit looks like this. If this is zero, it looks like this. This is a flat line, and then after zero, it's just a linear value. 
And there are a bunch of other activation functions and we use them in different ways and different ones are more successful or more computationally expensive and stuff like this. Okay, but every single neuron in our diagram above right here, each of these, you know, has the sum and the bias and an activation function. And typically, every layer uses the same activation. And it's actually quite typical for every neuron in the entire network to use the same activation function, except for the final output nodes. And they'll typically have a special activation function that is particular to the problem, that, the kind of problem that you're solving. Okay. But so that's kind of every node looks like this. And when we do our, our training process, we have some, you know, very large series, you know, we have a model, a neural network, and it's got hundreds, two thousands of input neurons, and we've got a bunch of layers. And all of these layers are connected, you know, deeply and richly to each other. I'm not going to draw all the lines because that would just take way too much time, but they're densely connected, every node connected to every other node. And then we finally have some output nodes. If this is a binary classifier, a yes, no decision maker, then we just have two output nodes. And these are, this is the representation of the math function that we send all of our training samples through. Okay, so we send all these training samples through this thing and out comes a yes or a no decision based on which of these nodes has a large value. So, you know, this one is yes, this one is no. We use a special activation function called softmax, which basically makes it so that the value of these two nodes will sum to one and we can interpret it as a probability. So our output for our yes no classifier will actually be something like 0.97 and the other one will be 0.3 and we'll say we think that there's a 97% chance of a yes answer. Yes to the binary decision. Okay. So this really is the core of what a neural network is that we just have many, 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 many such nodes and we train them using a mathematical process. It's called back propagation. It's based on the gradient, if you remember calculus. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail in that here. There are lots of other good videos you can watch about gradient descent and neural networks and I'll link one in the show notes that I really like from um, one of my favorite YouTubers on math stuff and computer programming stuff. But now I want to talk about kind of what this means and why we have questions about, you know, how these systems replicate bias in the real world and how these systems are deployed in ways where we say like, you know what, it's math, it's objective, when in reality, it's, it's not at all. It's not objective, it's not even close to objective, it is math but it's so reliant on this data that we put in, okay? So the fundamental truth of deep learning and machine learning in general is that this thing, our model, it can only learn what patterns are prevalent in the data that we give it, okay? So let's talk about an example that Amazon attempted to do, but shuddered. This is a kind of classic example. They tried to use machine learning and neural networks to say, I want to build a system that takes as input resumes. Okay, so it's a natural language text processing system. And they're gonna take in resumes that they have seen at Amazon as their training data. They're gonna run it through a neural network, which is math, it's complex math, just like we talked about above. And every time it sees a resume, they're going to train it against whether or not this person was hired, right? Okay, so let's say this resume got hired, this resume got hired, this resume didn't get hired, and this resume didn't get hired. And we replicate this across, you know, tens of thousands or millions of, of samples of people who've applied to work at Amazon. And this neural network is then going to be tasked with, at the end of the day, saying yes or no, we should take this interview 
or take this resume and interview this person. Okay, so that's what they trained it to do, and you know they spent lots of lots of hours trying to build this system and train it up. Blah 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 blah. And when they finally had a trained model, they evaluated that model, and what they found is that their model significantly punished women. Okay, at the end of the day, when they when they trained it with other resumes, they found that if that resume belonged to a woman, this algorithm was much more likely to recommend that they did not interview that person. And that's even knowing that the neural network didn't explicitly receive any information about the gender or sex of the people on the resumes, only the text of the resume itself. So the neural network appeared to have learned, according to Amazon's own research, appeared to have learned how to, A, determine that a resume comes from a woman, and that might be inference based on the name, or it might be inference based on some of the types of things that you would see appear on a resume. So, you know, like, I went through the um, women who code, whoops, so program, and that would be a sign, or, you know, it was like, I, I volunteer for the League of Women Voters in San Francisco, and that would be a sign. Um, and there are lots of other kinds of signs like that. And similar with names, it can learn to associate, you know, Susan and Karen and Laura with femaleness versus, you know, Mike and Tim and Fred with maleness. But regardless, this wasn't explicitly put in. The neural network was complex enough, you know, this math was complex enough to capture these relationships, but the, at the end of the day, it was a, an extremely biased system. And it was a biased system because this data represents societal bias, social bias in Amazon's historical hiring practices. So again, the system can only learn what we tell it to learn. And if we take data from the world, we take data from society, it will always have the same social biases that we exhibit. And so there are all kinds of examples of this, and I'll link some more in the show notes. There are some, you know, more and less insidious ones that, that could be more or less problematic, but some big ones are like, um, ProPublica did an expose about how these systems were used for uh, sentencing guidelines and the sentencing guidelines historically, the data that was used to train the system, punished black people more, you know, they had higher sentences. Um, and so the system learned to replicate that social bias. Um, big expose, I'll link that in the notes. Okay, and there's lots and lots and lots of other examples. This is, you know, a continuing system and these systems are being more and more used in the world. You've probably heard about problems with facial recognition and having similar problems, being less able to recognize uh, racial minorities and less able to recognize women than men. And that's a result of these training sets, similar to this Amazon example, these training sets having bias encoded in them. And so, you know, there's a big push and it's really important when you're building these systems to make sure that when you're building your training data, When you're building your training data, you want it to represent the world that you want, not necessarily just the world that you have. And so for Amazon, that would mean carefully going through all the resumes and being self-critical and saying, you know what, um, these women that we didn't hire, you know what, they they probably deserve to get hired, actually. And, and we messed that up. And making sure that you know you have balance in your classes. So if the actual rate of men to women at Amazon's engineering looks something like oops, this, you know, 20% women, or sorry, yeah, 20% women, 80% men, if that's what their engineering makeup looks like, then when they're building their training sample, 
you're going to want that to change that. You're going to want to change the samples that it gets so that it looks much more like the world you want, which is a world of equality. Oh, that shouldn't be there. A world of equality where you know you've got more like 50-50 representation, or at least something very close to it, right? So this is kind of the, the main mechanism through which bias gets embedded into these deep learning and machine learning models. It comes from the training data. It doesn't come from the math, but the mathematics are built through the training process. You know, we only have a template for a function before we train it. And once we've trained it, the math is actually a mathematical representation of whatever the bias is in the training data. Okay? So I hope this was a helpful explainer of what artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning are. And also, if you, you know, want to get into this field, I hope that you take some very serious consideration about, you know, unless you're studying some kind of physical, truly objective phenomenon, which most of the time you're not, although like weather prediction is something where neural networks are very powerful and, and work really well and is, you know, generally a physical phenomenon. But unless you're studying something like that, if you're applying deep learning to anything that's kind of a human process, you have to be aware that the data you're collecting comes from society and society has biases. So you need to correct your data in order to produce models that will get you towards the world you want to be in rather than just recreating and reinforcing the existing biases in the world that we have.